Hello and welcome to the conversation at airsafe.com, the official podcast of the airsafe.com foundation. I'm your host, Dr. Todd Curtis, the director of the foundation and the creator of airsafe.com, your reliable source of airline safety and security information since 1996. In this conversation, we'll talk about aircraft crash positions. Specifically, descriptions of the basic kinds of aircraft crash positions you may be expected to take in an airliner. Anyone who's flown as an airline passenger has seen the safety cards that illustrate how you should brace yourself in case of an emergency. These crash positions were based on years of research by the FAA, NASA, Transport Canada, and a variety of other organizations in the aviation industry. The ultimate goal is to enhance survivability. There are two basic benefits from assuming the crash position. The first is to reduce the amount of flailing by the body during an impact, and also to reduce secondary impacts. The key is head placement. The head is placed against the surface it's most likely to strike if the passenger experiences sudden deacceleration forces, the kind of forces that are likely to happen in a crash. Typically, the crash position is assumed only when the cabin crew or the flight crew orders it. Most passengers will go through their entire lives without ever hearing a cabin or a flight crew member give this order. If it were to happen, it's much more likely to happen during takeoff or landing and not during other phases of flight. Obviously, there are some events that are not survivable because of impact forces or other factors such as post-crash fires. But one should note a couple of things. In spite of the fact that many events leave no survivors, one should keep in mind that most accidents, even ones that lead to the complete destruction of the aircraft, are in fact survivable. The ability to survive, that is, to get out of the aircraft and get out of harm's way, depends on being physically able to do so. Assuming that crash position at the critical time could be the difference between survivability and death. As I stated earlier, several major aviation organizations have done extensive research on crash positions, and the review of those positions by airsafe.com reveals there are basically six kinds of positions. The first kind of crash position is in a forward-facing seat, typically in coach, where you don't have a whole lot of room in front of you. And the best position to assume is one where you cross your arms in front of you, holding on to the seat back in front of you, and placing your head against your seat back. The key thing again to remember is to keep your head in position so that if there is a sudden stop, if there is a sudden change of motion, you'd be less likely to suffer head trauma. Also, if you're able to keep your head below the level of the seat in front of you, should there be items falling from above, or should the ceiling of the cabin collapse, you'll have additional protection. If you're a passenger carrying a lap child, the same situation applies. If you're traveling with a lap child, you use the same position. You would hold on to the seat in front of you, putting your head against that seat, and use your other arm to hold the child. And of course, it goes without saying that you should use your lap belt and have it snugly across your waist. In summary, crash position one is used where you have a fairly small space, the kind of space you would see in coach class, where you don't have enough room to fully bend over and place your head between your knees. You would hold the seat in front of you, put your lap pedal on fairly tight, and place your head against the seat back. If you have sufficient space where you can put your head between your knees and not hit the seat in front of you, there are two other positions you can use. In crash position number two, you would put your head between your knees and wrap your arms under your legs behind your knees. A variation on this is crash position number three, where you would also put your head between your knees but grab your ankle. While typically you only have enough room to do this if you're sitting in seating such as business or first class, depending on the size of your body, you may have sufficient room and coach to do so. The next time you take a flight, you may take some time to assess your situation, depending on where you're sitting, whether or not you should do the first kind of position or the second or third kind of crash position. Now typically, when you go flying, you have seats in front of you. Sometimes, of course, you're sitting in front of a bulkhead. And if there's enough room in front of you, crash position number three would be just fine. If you don't have enough room, you would use crash position number four. You would put your arms in front of you, much like you would do in crash position number one. Instead of placing your head against the seat back, you'd be doing it in front of a bulkhead. Once again, this would be a situation where you'd be in a forward-facing seat next to a bulkhead. If you happen to be in a rear-facing seat and you only have a lap belt, which is typically the case for rear-facing passenger seats, you would use crash position number five. You wouldn't cross your arms in front of your body or lean your head against any surface like a seat back or a bulkhead. That's because when an aircraft is coming to a stop, obviously the forces would be throwing you toward the front of the plane. And if you're already sitting with your back toward the front of the plane, then keeping your head upright is the best thing to do. So you would sit up straight, 
and place your head against the back of the seat. The last crash position, position number six, is typically the kind of position taken by a flight attendant or another crew member because it will be in a rear facing seat with a lap belt and a shoulder harness. You would use a lap belt in combination with the shoulder harness and whether you sit up with your head against the cushion or with your head bent over will depend on your particular company's procedures. Before I end this conversation, I'd like to remind all my listeners that this podcast is sponsored by the airsafe.com foundation. This nonprofit organization is responsible for this podcast and for a variety of other efforts to further the public's understanding of aviation safety and aviation security. For information about the foundation or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit the foundation at airsafe.org. For more information about airline safety, you can find us at airsafe.com. That's A-I-R-S-A-F-E dot com. Or type the words airline safety into your favorite search engine. We're probably on the first page of results. The information in this podcast were from materials provided by the FAA, the Flight Safety Foundation, Transport Canada, and the airsafe.com foundation. Those of you with an interest in aviation safety, especially with an interest in the analysis of aviation safety data, might be interested in my first book, Understanding Aviation Safety Data. It was originally published in the year 2000, and it's a detailed guide for asking and answering aviation safety and security questions. You can find this book on the web at orders.speedbreak.com. Also available from Speedbreak Publishing is my latest book, Parenting in the Internet, which is a practical how-to guide for parents of online children. This book was published this year and is also available at orders.speedbreak.com. You can support airsafe.com by visiting airsafe.com at airsafe.com and especially by leaving feedback at feedback.airsafe.org. Also, if you'd like to see other episodes of this podcast, please visit podcast.airsafe.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.